Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Today's episode is brought to you by the Health Coach Success Virtual Masterclass. My co-host Laura and I worked hard to pull together this special online event just for you. It's a five-day mini course in which we interview the best and brightest health coach and marketing experts on the planet to try to understand how they've become such great coaches and entrepreneurs. Included in the 20 plus expert interviews are some names you might recognize. Primal Health Coach Institute founder Mark Sisson, celebrity nutrition expert and New York Times bestselling author JJ Virgin, author, cardiologist, and staunch health coach advocate Dr. William Davis, Michelle Liotta of Health Coach Power Community, Michelle Norris, CEO of Paleo FX and ID Life Nutrition, and many, many more. The Health Coach Success Virtual Masterclass is now available and totally free for a limited time. Check it out at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash success. Today's guest is one of our absolute faves, Dr. Jade Tita. Dr. Tita has unofficially been dubbed the metabolism guy, but he's also an expert in women's hormones, men's hormones, functional health and medicine, and honestly, tons more areas of expertise than you could even begin to wrap your mind around including building online business, content marketing strategies. Oh, and he's also published several books, including one on the human condition and how to level up your humanness. Oh, and he also hosts the Next Level Human podcast that covers all of these topics and more. His work straddles the line between personal development and physical development, which is probably why he's such a great fit for our show. Health entrepreneurs need to straddle that line too. By training, he's a naturopathic physician specializing in integrative endocrinology, applying both conventional and alternative methods to the study of hormones and metabolism. So of course, we talked a lot about that in this episode. We've been dying to get Dr. Tita on the show forever, so let's just dial back the verbosity of this intro and get to it. Remember that the show notes for our episodes can always be found at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. We'd love to have you screenshot your podcast app and tag us on Instagram at Health Coach Radio. And don't forget to tag Dr. Tita too at Jade Tita. We'll tag you back. We hope you enjoy this conversation as much as we did. Please welcome Dr. Jade Tita. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Jade Tita. How are you? Aaron, how are you, my friend? Laura, how does I get to see you as well? <laughs> yeah, it's I'm re- great I'm to ready, see you. I'm ready to talk shop. Oh, that's okay, good. We are going to pick your brain intensely, so get ready. All right, I'm ready. Um, but, but the way every podcast likes to start and the way we like to start is the origin story. So we'd love for you to just fill in for our listeners who, who you are and why the heck we should be listening to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll just fast forward through this beginning part. But I started at 15 years old, which is people go, that's kind of crazy. What do you mean you started at 15 <laughs> years old? Well, I was, very, I had two older brothers and a mom who was into natural medicine um, and my brothers were athletic and I just wanted to follow in their footsteps. So it started with football, American football. And um, I started writing programs for the kids on my football team. And that was the beginning of, I think my personal training career. And that quickly turned into very quickly. Now I'm writing programs for their mom. So I'm in high school at this point. And uh, yeah, I know it's crazy. And I'm, then I start falling in love with, hey, I want to be better at football. So let me learn how to train and let me learn how to eat to be better at football. And, you know, it's interesting. Passions are one of those things that they're fleeting, right? They come and they go. But when you get to meaning and purpose, it kind of sticks. And so mm-hmm. football went away, but the meaning and purpose began to stick. And what that was, was a love for uh, nutrition and a love for fitness. And so I kind of went to undergrad and I said, what do I want to study? Because I'm so in love with nutrition and the way the body works. So, of course, that led me to biochemistry and got very deep into biochemistry. And I'm one of these kids that when I was in when I was in high school, I was all about football, skipping class. I'd skip class and then go to football practice. You know, but once <laughs> I got into college and started doing something I loved, you know, when meaning and purpose started to take over my life, I was like reading, you know, Uh, textbooks and biochemistry books at that point and started really getting into personal training. 
I was also bartending along the way. So this is where my philosophy psychology background comes in. So I kind of, (laughs) I was personal training and bartending. That's the way I paid my way through school. And I also minored in psychology slash philosophy and majored in sort of biochemistry. Now, you, you two will appreciate this because I got to a point in my life where I'm like, okay, I'm going to medical school. I want to be, you know, a healer, basically. Mm-hmm. And I started looking at the curriculums and was shocked because I hadn't, I didn't understand at the time what people were actually doing in medicine at the time. And what I saw was they didn't teach you nutrition and they didn't teach you exercise. And there was no psychology and behavioral aspects of getting people to change. And it floored me and kind of depressed me at the time. I remember being like, what am I going to do now? Mm -hmm. And my older brother, Keone, um, he was just finishing up his master's degree and he was sort of looking to go into a field. And he sent me this brochure for back then it was brochures, not websites. Right. So he sends me this brochure and he goes, (laughs) he goes, what do you think about this university called Bastyr university, which is in Seattle, Washington, and it trains naturopathic physicians. And I was like, I don't know. Let me look at it started asking around. Of course, everyone's like, oh my God, you don't want to do that. That's quack medicine. That's crazy Mm -hmm. stuff. But I'm looking at the curriculum and I'm like, they teach nutrition, they teach fitness, they teach behavioral change. I don't care. I'm jumping in. And so I went to a medical school that trained primary care physicians in essentially lifestyle medicine, the stuff that the three of us do. Mm -hmm. And the final part of this story was, you know, um, I oftentimes talk about passions are kind of fleeting and, you know, sort of meaning is it sticks on you a little bit, but it's not as deep as purpose, but at purpose you have to choose. So I had a choice to make. I had a choice between being a healer and being in the clinic or being a teacher and teaching this medicine out in the world. So these two choices and I went with teacher. So at that point, my purpose became teacher. I opened up a consulting clinic. I opened up a boot camp. I started a blog and that turned into, uh, and I wrote a book and I didn't realize I was just a guy just doing his purpose. And all of a sudden um, things kind of blew up for me. And I found myself being in a position in this field that we all teach in where people were paying attention to what I was saying, which was kind of bizarre and surreal for me, but also really beautiful because I was like, wow, I'm going to be one of the lucky people whose purpose gets to be their job. And now yeah. if you want to know sort of who I am, you take a, take sort of a jock and put that in a blender and then take sort of a nature boy and put that in a blender and put a science bird, you know, sort of nerd in the blender as well. <laughs> and a little bit of a philosopher in the blender and a personal trainer. And you kind of have what I do. And my specialty is very similar to the two of you. My specialty is, you know, sort of uh, metabolism and specifically sort of uh, metabolism as it pertains to uh, weight loss and uh, body composition change. And that's primarily what I do now, although there's just one small addendum to this story is I also now, because I've had you know, some success in this field, I also now have come back to my roots in philosophy and psychology and begun to um, teach more of that. And this, I guess, is one of the lessons I think in business is that when you start business, one of the things I realize is you have to niche at first. You mm-hmm. can't be so yeah. broad at first, but once you have right. some success, in that niche, then you can start to branch out a little bit. So I find myself in this unique place now where I get to teach what I call mind, muscle, and metabolism. And so you can kind of see where the psychology philosophy, the personal training, and sort of the deep biochemistry background comes into it. So sorry to go too long with that, but hopefully Mm -hmm. that gives you a sense of where I came from and sort of where I am. And it's completely amazing to be able to do this work. Absolutely. I know, I know Aaron and I both feel very blessed to have been able to leave because we, we didn't start out, neither one of us professionally in this area. Neither one of us have a degree in this. Neither one of us had a professional background in this until we just started doing it, right? We went and got an education and get out there and started practice because we both had a passion and a purpose for helping others because we had both experienced, you know, some, some real health issues that, you know, conventional medicine couldn't help us overcome because what was wrong with us was the, a direct consequence of lifestyle and nutrition and dietary behaviors. So, you know, I, I totally get where you're coming from when you said, you know, I wanted to be a healer and realize if I went to medical school, I'm not going to be a healer, right? Yep. 
yep. you're not going to be able to do that. And so I just love that. And there is so much about just the human animal that is rooted in metabolism. It's more than just body composition and weight loss. There are so many things. So I would love for you to, to speak to that a little bit, you know, um, on the role, well, just kind of how important that really is and how that really branches off and can affect so many different things from the mind and muscle and your body's ability to control for those things. I know that's a big, broad question. Yeah. No, I actually, Laura, I love that question because like, here's the interesting thing, right? To me in this field, and I know you two are educators like me, right? right. So all three of us teach. And I, I think distinctions matter. And when we define things correctly and we have the right sort of framework for something, results sort of flow out of that. So to me, mm -hmm. this, is the, this is actually the perfect place to start because the distinction that we have for metabolism and the framework that we've all been operating under metabolism, and when I say we all, I don't mean us three, I mean the broader field, has been a model of metabolism as calculator. And mm -hmm. so, and also metabolism as chemistry set. And so I'll just, let me cover those two first and let me present what I think is a different model. And of course it will, it will evolve, but here's, awesome. here's what I mean by metabolism as calculator. We've all grown up with the idea of calories in calories out for a long time. This is the way that we all perceive metabolism. That it's just this mm -hmm. rudimentary calculator that looks out there and says, okay, if I'm taking in this amount of calories, and I'm expending this amount, then health and fitness and body composition will magically sort of appear for me and I'll be good to go. And this is where we still see a lot of people talking about, it all comes down to calories, it's calories in, it's calories out. Now, it is true that the metabolism does have, in a sense, the ability to regulate its calories and it does pay attention to energy in and energy out, but it's a small part of what it does. And part of that model fails, right? So yeah, when we're in our 20s and we're doing that, you know, it seems to work pretty good for a lot of us. Then we start realizing, wow, this doesn't seem to work for everybody. It used to work for me. It no longer works for me. And in some cases, not all, pushing this to the extreme actually leads to issues. And so right. then we kind of said, well, and by we, I mean the greater community kind of said, you know, there's other things sort of going on here. There's hormones involved as we started to get more savvy. And so then we started talking about metabolism as chemistry set. Like all you need is to put a little bit of insulin in and a little bit of cortisol and, you know, a little bit of growth hormone and testosterone and manage your estrogen and progesterone and magically everything will fall into place. And this had some strengths and it had some real weaknesses as well, because just like a calculator, you can't just magically have a mix of hormones. It's going to turn your body into a fat burning, healthy machine. And so, mm -hmm. yes, the metabolism is somewhat of a calculator. And yes, it's somewhat of a hormonal sort of driving mechanism as well. But both of these models sort of fall short. So what's a model that incorporates both of these and adds more? The model, I think that if we're going to give the metabolism an analogy, which I don't think we ever should because the metabolism is so complicated, but if we're going to, I would say it's most like a stress barometer or a stress thermostat. Essentially, what our metabolism is designed to do, if we go back to ancestral times, ancient humans, uh, hunter-gatherer types, mm -hmm. we have been on this, we have been in the modern day for basically half a second, whereas yes. our metabolism evolved you know, right. over a 20, if we broke all metabolism down into a 24 hour period, we've been doing this modern way of living for a fraction of a second. For most of our existence, our metabolism was confronted with uh, the inability to, you know, have food available all the time. And so what it did is it looked out there in the world and said, what is the availability of food? What are the sort of insults out there that could potentially kill me? How do, how do I avoid lions and tigers and bears, oh my? Like, what is going on with temperature and what is going on with light? And then it started to institute all these reactions to help us get back to balance and survive these environmental influences. And so what happens is, as the, as the environment becomes more stressful, our stress barometer starts to you know, hit the level red, so to speak, and then our body has natural biofeedback that adapts to that. And so mm -hmm. if we understand that, yes, the metabolism is partly a calculator, and yes, it's partly a hormonal chemistry set, but that it's mostly this mechanism that helps us adapt, react, 
be flexible to the environment around us. Now we can have a different conversation about uh, how the metabolism responds. I'll say one more thing here, then I'll shut up to get your feedback. But the thing here is, is that once we understand that, then we go, okay, that's really interesting. Then how can we read and respond to the metabolism? If it's a stress barometer, what are the signals that are telling us our stress barometer is going into the red zone? What are the signals that are telling us stress is building up too much in the body? Well, for the ancestral human, the number one stress they encountered more than anything else was lack of food. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we are in un any kind of stress, typically the, metab the metabolic software will fall back to that, that stress reaction. And that stress reaction elicits a very predictable set of biofeedback sensations. Those are hunger going mm -hmm. uh, crazy. You're hungry all the time. Those are energy becoming unpredictable and unstable and falling. Those are cravings for highly palatable foods. For example, if you come across honey in the woods and you haven't seen food, you're going to gorge on that honey because you never know when you're going to see it again. So hunger, energy, and cravings. I have, a, I have a silly acronym I become known for called HEC, H-E-C. Keeping your HEC in check means that your stress barometer is not in the red yet. But once your HEC goes out of check, that's a good indication that your stress barometer is now actually under too much stress. Now, this is a beautiful concept in a sense when you think about it, because then it tells us if I can keep my heck in check, the calorie equation and the chemistry set model start taking care of themselves a little bit. So this hunger, energy, and cravings, heck, or sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings, schmeck, keeping those in check tells us about calories and hormones. And so as coaches, um, th those of us who, who do this in teaching, this is a model that we can begin to use um, to teach about metabolism without talking about estrogen and progesterone and cortisol and mm -hmm. uh, GLP and GIP and neuropeptide Y and all these things that, that our clients don't really care about. All they want to know is, why is my metabolism not working? Why am I not getting the results I want? And then we can come along and say, because your stress barometer is peaked. I know this because your sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings are out of balance. We need to get that in check first. And then we can start doing intuitive eating or counting calories or managing our macros or doing all the other things that most other people are trying to do. Those things don't work without first understanding, is my metabolism regulated appropriately? So I'll shut up now and just see what you two think about that. And is that you know what you have to add to it and, and your thought process about it? So I, I love the HEC acronym and the SHMEC mm -hmm. acronym as well. Very good. Uh, one of the things that I think it comes in really handy for, and I think I should preface this by saying that the three of us on this call and probably a few people listening are aligned in this belief that metabolism is complex and it's more of a barometer or thermostat than, like you right. said, a calculator chemistry set. However, some people on this listening to this call haven't quite gotten there yet. They still think it's a calculator, which is cool. Well, we'll get, we'll start, you know, changing their minds as we go. But what I find is really beneficial with the, the HEC acronym is that when my clients are asking me as a metabolism coach, how do I know if it's working? Because I step on the scale and it's not showing or my, you know, my pants aren't falling off yet. And I'll say, well, how is your appetite? What is hunger feeling like? What is energy feeling like? What is craving? What are cravings feeling like? Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, I haven't really been hungry. I can go a pretty long time now without food. I don't get hangry anymore. And now that you mention it, uh, my energy is pretty level throughout the day. And um, gosh, now that you ask, I, I really haven't been craving sweets at all. I'm like, great, it's working. And this is a subjective experience that clients are so detached from because the health consumer has been bewildered, unfortunately, by us, the health and fitness world, because we told them it was a calculator. We told them if you just, if you just track this and measure this and weigh this and micromanage this, it all comes out in the wash. And nobody's connected to the experience of being in their body, which is why I love heck. And I love that you, you have such a gift for, for creating like um, analogies that really yeah. land with the end user which I think is really important for, for coaches listening to understand. Like we have to speak to the end user. Mm -hmm. This is one of my great crusades. I feel like we spent the last year arguing amongst ourselves, you know, <laughs> debating on the Joe Rogan podcast and debunking not, nutrition documentaries. And it's like, eh, the person who's getting lost in that conversation is the health consumer. So thank mm -hmm. you for, for just keeping it very simple for people and just yeah. breaking those concepts down. Yeah, I mean, I still see way too much of this calculator analogy 
particularly in my world, the, the whole CrossFit world and, you know, some of the programs that I see that are really popular, whether it's Renaissance periodization or Stronger You or some of these very big, if it fits your macros. And, and many of them are, when they first started, quality hormones didn't really enter the equation. They're starting to now. They're getting better, which is fantastic. But, you know, I, I am a prime example of what happens when all you do is consider it as a calculator. Because when I, when I came from another field, I actually got sick from being too hypocaloric and working out too much because yeah. I worked in a male dominated industry. I was one of very few women. So I had to work harder and look better than everybody else. Right. Not so not to mention the stress. Yeah. Right. So stress is out of crazy because of that. I'm not sleeping well. I'm hungry all the time because I'm trying to, I'm all eating all these diet foods and I'm on the treadmill or the elliptical and all this other stuff, like way too much. I was thin. I was like 112 pounds. I'm now 125 pounds and I look much better than I did back then, but I, I was very sick and it wasn't until I started to really understand these other inputs that affect my own metabolism that could lower stress that allowed me to sleep better. Not to mention my boy, back then I was a single mom. I had two kids, a single mom and my mood Oh, you did not want to mess with me. You know, now I have four kids, you know, and life is just much better. Right. But the danger of only looking at it as a calculator just can, there's so much damage that can be done. And it, it drives me nuts when I see experts out there, PhDs out there arguing that as long as your macros work in your favor, pop tarts are okay. <laughs> or, they'll, yeah. or they'll preface, well, you know, you should be, but you know, that's the beauty of flexible dieting. And anything that requires that I weigh and measure everything. I don't, I don't understand how that's flexible with the except that exception that, well, as long as I can shoehorn that donut in there somewhere, I guess it's flexible. Uh, but you gotta, you know, it's just, I love the barometer because had I known that there are so many things that should have been huge red flags for me because all of this stuff wasn't sleeping really well, hungry all the time. My mood was shit. My energy was all over the place. And I was, because I was craving everything, it, it impacted everything else. You know, you know, it's interesting when we, when we think about this sort of biofeedback sort of model, yeah. it's um, once you start to understand that, like I, I, it sounds like the two of you have, have also run into, you know, personal sort of, uh, overstressing the body and then seeing the, the negative impact on your metabolism. Mm -hmm. I have too, right? So the three of us have had that experience. Plus I've had, you know, thousands, tens of thousands when you include uh, my online, you know, sort of coaching. Uh, so I've seen this happen again and again and again, but here's sort of the problem. Uh, and, and the research, when you get really into this, this teases this out about 25% of the population can pretty, put a lot of stress on their system mm -hmm. and still look pretty good and not have their heck schmeck go that out of check. And what's interesting about these people is they end up being the ones who end up in this field. Uh, and let yeah. me explain that to, mm -hmm. to, to you a little bit. A lot of people think that, you know, um, athletes um, sort of look the way they look because of the sports that they do. But the truth is most of the time athletes do what they do and have this natural proclivity to find sports that they excel at. Yes. And then they sort of start doing that. So it's not that, you know, if, if I start, look, I'm a big bulky linebacker looking dude. If I get on a bike and pedal like crazy or run for miles every day, I'm never going to look like a marathoner. So mm -hmm. I naturally gravitated towards the things that I was good at sprinting, powerlifting, bodybuilding, linebacker and, and fullback in, in, you know, football. I'm just that kind of guy. I'm never going to be this marathon runner type. And what people don't understand is that very lean, very fit individuals tend to find their way into this field. And right. most of these people don't ever stop to think and go, I've never actually struggled with my weight. I've never actually felt heck or schmeck go out of check. This is easy for me. Therefore, they think it's easy for all the clients that they're working with. Meanwhile, 75% of the population does not have right. an easy, uh, you know, sort of approach with this. And even them as they age, will start to find that their metabolism is not going to respond as well as it once did. So that's the first thing I would say as coaches, 
we need to realize that we need to take the bias out of this and realize that this is easy for us. Some people are good communicators. Some people are not. Some people are good at cooking. Some people are not. Some people are, you know, endurance built people. Some people are anaerobic built people. And we tend to find and go into niches that we're good at. That's the first thing that I'll say. The, the other thing I'll say about this is that in my mind, what we humans like to do, very wrongly so in my opinion, and I do think it's a measure of maturity. So now we're talking psychology and philosophy. Here. <laughs> Bias is a measure of maturity. The degree to which you are biased in your approach mm -hmm. is the degree to which I can measure your maturity as a human. So if you think it's my way and that's the only way, or you only have one to three, you know, one or to three sort of approaches. To me, that tells you where your evolution is in this field in a yeah. sense. Most of us who have been around a while and have you know, kind of took, taken the hard knocks and sort of let our bias fall aside, realize that both matter, that calories do matter yeah. and hormones do matter. And this, this sort of the hypothalamus, you know, sort of neuroendocrine immune sort of uh, you know, aspect of the metabolism matters. So the question then becomes, how do we make sense of this for the vast majority of people who are trying to lose weight? And I, I essentially break it down like this. And then I want to see what, what you two think about this, because you may or may not agree. And I love just these discussions because you just learn a ton. Mm -hmm. But the way I look at it is there are two things required for lasting fat loss. And I use lasting for a reason, because we all know that 95% of people who go on diets, regain the weight, 66% right. end up fatter. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, you can lose weight, but will it last? So it's lasting. And I also use fat loss rather than weight loss, because you can lose all kinds of different things, but fat loss is what we want. So mm -hmm. lasting fat loss mm -hmm. requires calorie deficits. We absolutely know that that is true. There is no doubt about that. So in my mind, anyone that says calories don't matter, is, you know, doesn't really have a whole lot of credibility. Now, at the same time, anyone who says calories are all that matters, to me, also lacks credibility. Calories matter, yes. But what also matters is metabolic hormonal balance. Now, when I use that term, quote, metabolic hormonal balance, people go, well, what the hell does that mean? All it <laughs> means is the hormones that are responsible for hunger, energy management, cravings, exercise performance, exercise recovery, libido, um, uh, signs and symptoms of disease, all these biofeedback sensations matter. They matter because they're what's managing this energy system. So from my perspective, you need both of these. Now, here's the interesting thing that happens. If you do just a calorie model, what ends up happening is you throw off hormonal metabolic balance. Again, 25% of people, some of you, this doesn't happen. Okay, good for you. But guess what? As you age, it will begin mm -hmm. to happen. I can promise you that. But for the other 75%, when you're telling them just, uh, you know, just approach it from a calorie point of view, you're throwing off the other side of this equation, the hormonal side of this equation. So what I'm trying to say here is yes, quantity matters, but also quality matters. Yeah. They're not this bias that we create, this black and white dichotomy that we create that one's more important than the other to me is wrong. It, they are equally important. In fact, they're synergis synergistic and, and dependent on, one each other, on, on each other. If you focus on quality, uh, you automatically impact quantity. If you focus on quantity the right way, you automatically impact quality. And right. this is what we should be doing. So then the question becomes, well, how do we manage both of these? And in my mind, what we start to do is we start to look at what are the things for me as an individual that first and foremost, make my metabolism feel stable and vital. This is where the schmeck heck part of this comes mm -hmm. in. Now, once we get to that place, now we can push on the metabolism a little bit. Now we can say, let's pay attention to macros and calories and that kind of stuff. And to me, I'll say one more thing and then I'll shut up here and get your in in input. But to me, this also is determined by the individual. We are each uniquely metabolic. We're each uniquely unique in our psychology and in our personal preferences. So if you are someone who is a calorie counter macro person, I'm not mad at you. Let's start there. Mm -hmm. But realize that's going to impact heck or schmeck, and then we're going to have to adjust. Yep. Now, if you're an intuitive right. person and you want to just focus on quality of food, I'm not mad at you. Okay, let's go to heck and schmeck and see if we can get you balanced. But then at some point, we also need to see the scale tick down. And so to me, 
All we do is cross over. It's very easy. It's not hard at all. We just go, okay, you want to count calories? If Schmeck and Heck go out of check, we need to adjust. Oh, you want to just do intuitive? Well, if you're not losing weight, then we need to look at calories. Mm -hmm. And that's what a good coach will do. They'll look at both of these simultaneously. So I want to see what you two think about this, because I actually don't understand why we make a big deal of the two. Right. To me, they're the same thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. and one thing that one of your my favorite sound bites of yours is, well, I love when you say anybody says any, calories, the only thing that matters have is no, credi no credibility. And the, who says calories don't matter has no credibility. But you've also said the next time somebody tells you calories are all that matter, um, ask them how many calories there are in a poor night's sleep or in yeah. chronic stress load and things like that. So, but, but what's, what's kind of what I, what I really like about this approach and I hope coaches listening are, are picking this up is that like, you, you are, in my opinion, famously unbiased. You're one of the least biased people. At, I don't know how if you've lobotomized yourself. I don't know how you did that, <laughs> but like you, you really can come at this from a very uh, contextual angle. I remember there was one time you posted something on Instagram and I commented because you said there really is no one, one perfect human diet. Now, from somebody who comes from an ancestral diet approach, it's like, well, yes, there is. It's the ancestral diet. You know, it's paleo, right? I, that's what I believe. That's what really worked for me. So I put that. I, you probably don't remember this, but I said, well, like, where do you start then with clients? Like, where do we start? We have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. I like paleo. And you said, well, let's start with paleo. But yeah. just be really nimble when the client shows up with these symptoms. And so I just think no matter where you're starting, paleo, carnivore, plant-based, keto, whatever, macros counting, be, just be willing to kind of quasi lobotomize yourself when the client shows up with certain uh, subjective experiences. Mm -hmm. And just as a closing thought for me before I throw it to my co-host, I came up with a pretty cool little uh, um, um, abbreviation that I thought I might run past you to see if you like it. Uh, yeah. I-I-F-Y-C. If it fits your context. Eh? Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. I, I love it. Yep. Because oh, that's, yeah. that, that's absolutely the way I think it should be taught. For sure. Because I love it when clients come up to me and are like, so, hey, Laura, are bananas healthy? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> are we talking a banana in a smoothie or are we talking five bananas for breakfast? Because those are two different contexts, right? And let's define healthy. Um, you know, to, to go back to your question about, you know, why, why, why do these things have to be on opposite sides of the spectrum? You are absolutely right that they crossover. And, and I think this all kind of gets rooted in heck and schmeck in this metabolic health, because those who are metabolically or hormonally imbalanced, intuitive eating is not going to work very well mm -hmm. No, because your intuition is ice cream, yeah. right? You know, so that doesn't work, right? You've got to kind of get this in check. And sometimes a little bit of the, you know, I often will have my clients, maybe not track initially, but a food journal, to begin with, right? And, and get practice with that is really, really helpful. It's very eye-opening. And then they start to ask more questions. And then the idea of actually tracking something, because I'll hear from people, I don't eat a lot of sugar until they start writing stuff down. And I'm able to help them. Do you understand really what goes into this food? And then on the other side, as far as just doing nothing but tracking macros, if you're not listening to your body, how do you know those are really working in your favor and that they're doing, they're not, they're not serving you, right? There's got to be, a, there's got to be both. Yeah. And, you know, I think, again, it comes down to this, this rigid adherence to things, right? And so the thing that the three of us are talking about is this idea of if you really want to become, you know, a master of your metabolism, in a sense, you have to become more like a metabolic detective rather than yeah. a dieter or, if, or an, if it fits your macros person or a paleo mm -hmm. person or whatever, because, you know, I agree, like I'm actually more on your, if, if you know, and thank you, Aaron, for saying, because I've worked very hard to take my bias out of it. But if you want to know a little bit of my bias, because I'm human, I have it. If you had to say, Jade, you know, I'm going to pin you down, like I'll add a gun to your head, you got to choose a <laughs> diet that you think would be best for the vast majority of people, I probably would focus on paleo, the traditional paleo, which would be, you know, a little bit more, you know, lower fat animals that, you know, were lean. So, you know, yeah. vegetables and lean protein, right? That's where I would go. However, the interesting thing about that is that's going to work for some people and, and not for others. And, and in my clinical experience, here's what I see. Take any protocol you want, vegan, vegetarian, paleo, primal, keto, you know, whatever you want. And what you will typically see is it's going to work wonderfully for a third of the people. A third of the people are going to get no response. And a third of people are going to be miserable. 
And mm-hmm. to me, what we should be teaching our clients is basically like, hey, listen, I am, you, I'm agnostic. You can do whatever you want to do. But what my job as a coach is to teach you whether it's working for you or not. So to me, if someone comes to me and they're excited about a particular nutritional protocol, I'm like, perfect. That's great. Let's start there. And then I'm going to teach you how to read your metabolism and we'll adjust. So that's the first point I'll make. Now, to go to intuitive eating versus counting, right? To me, intuition, here's what I think a lot of people miss about intuition. Intuition, for some reason, people think is magical. Like it's just this magical thing. Well, intuition has been studied and I'm a research nerd. So we know what intuition is and what intuition actually is. It's not magic, right? So every human on the planet has a degree of intuition. Some people just honed it a little bit more. Intuition is a sixth sense. It's basically, and you out in the world, you're living your life and you're gathering experiences. And it's basically when you see something and you interact with something, you merge all these senses, plus you pull up all your past experiences and you go, ah, I think it might work like this, Mm -hmm. which is why you can't have intuition in a field that you know nothing about. You know, I oftentimes use, uh, you know, the guy Sully who landed the plane on the Hudson. They oftentimes talk, if you think about it, a pilot, a pilot develops intuition because they have thousands of takeoffs and landings and they know what that plane feels like. So when something goes wrong with someone like Sully in his plane and the tower is telling him, you can make it back to the runway. And he goes, no, I can't. I know that I can't. And he, his intuition kind of overpowers and then he ends up landing it in the Hudson instead of crashing into a, you know, which they determined he would have ended up crashing into a right. building otherwise. In nutrition, I think what we need to realize is that to develop intuition, there does need to be a degree of understanding and tracking and or food journaling or some way of understanding about food. You can't Mm -hmm. just, in my opinion, go from someone who has never interacted with food and doesn't know that chicken doesn't have carbohydrates in it, a chicken breast. I once had a client say, how many, you know, like how much, how many carbohydrates does a chicken breast have? And I'm like, mm-hmm. uh, zero other than like maybe the trace amounts of glycogen in, in, right. in the muscle, but there's zero there. You need to know that, right? You need to know what eight ounces of chicken breast. No, I bet you the three of us, right? We could probably look intuitively right now. If someone put down, you know, eight ounces of chicken breast with a cup of broccoli and two cups of rice, I guarantee we would pretty accurately be like, this is how many, about how many calories this has, about how many grams of protein, carbohydrates and fat it has. Most people can't do that. Now, I'm not saying that they can't learn intuition and start there. Some people do just go are relatively intuitive and can figure it out. But some people absolutely need some of this experience of at Mm -hmm. least tracking. So I love to hear your thought about food journaling because that to me is it doesn't have to be counting calories. It can just simply be coming aware of portions or aware of macros or aware of amounts. And most of us have gone through that process. So from my perspective, I typically do it this way. I go, do you want to be an intuitive eater? Cool. I'm down with that. Let's do it. Let's see if it works. If it doesn't, maybe I'm going to have to make you count and do some calories for a while so you can develop more intuition. Oh, you want to be a calculator and, you know, counting person? Perfect. But if it doesn't work, I may need to help you understand how to be more intuitive and listening to your body. So to me, I don't know why us as coaches just don't go, hey, wherever you want to start, I'm cool, but I'm going to teach you how to be a metabolic detective. You're not going to be a dieter and just a counter when I get done with you. And you're not going to be just an intuitive person when I get done with you. You're going to go from this black and white dichotomy to more gray. And to me, that's Mm -hmm. what I think we should be doing. That's what good coaches do. Totally. Yes. I mean, part of the reason people are coming to you, like by the time someone's willing to like pay money out of pocket to come see a coach, they're finally ready to kind of figure this out. You know, they're totally bewildered. And what I've, what I've done for some folks in the past that, that really are having a hard time understanding, you know, why their body is behaving the way it's behaving. And we do a food journal. Um, I did this w- with two different clients and it was super eye opening. Ha- they had their food journal, they had what they ate. Not necessarily how much or calories or whatever, but then I had to make three columns, protein, fats, and carbohydrate. And then we talked about each one and where it kind of belonged. And inevitably, there are tons and tons of people that realize 
just how much fat and just how many carbohydrates they're actually consuming and how little protein. I, I said on a past episode, like another interview, that a huge number of my clients under eat protein over and over again because they think cheese is a great source of protein. And when we really talk about how that breaks down, like, yeah, it's got some protein in it, but really it's mostly fat. Same thing with nuts, by the way, right? Yep. And my, um, one of the vegan clients that came over eventually started incorporating meat because what he real look, he loves to work out. He loves to lift, lots of high intensity cardio. But when I kind of just ran his numbers, he kind of filled in a food log for me. He's, this guy is 225 pounds, six foot whatever. And he was maybe getting 70, 70 grams of protein a day. Right. And so when we tried to move him up and he realized that his vegan sources were predominantly carbohydrate and that he was going to have to now overcompensate, he was literally adding scoops of protein powder to everything to get there. And that's when the light bulb finally went off. Well, wait a minute. If I have to artificially add protein to every meal, is this really the right approach to me for me? So it was that simple mechanism of really helping him understand what these foods really do. And, and how they're made up. That was, that's been a really great exercise for at least two of my clients. I love using the detective uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this, this kind of maybe touches on niching because part of my sort of brand message is at this point anyway, and that this may change again as my, my practice evolves. And hopefully at some point I can lobotomize myself like you have Dr. Tita. But at this point, I'm very much, um, anti-counting only because of my background with like disordered eating yeah. and people who come to work with me know that about me. So they already know Aaron's not going to help me count my calories or macros, but I have done food journals, but here's how I do it. Same kind of idea, columns. Um, when did you eat? What was it? I don't really care how many ounces of chicken you ate. Don't even <laughs> bother with me with that information, but how long did that meal last you? When did hunger show up again? And what did that hunger feel like? Mm -hmm. And kind of how did your energy feel when, when that hunger emerged? Was it like, was it crazy hangry? Was it mellow? Was it quiet? Were you able to sit with it for a minute? Like just getting into the experience of what like heck feels like, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Um, that's what I want to know from people. And now sometimes we, we can benchmark by counting, you know, macros a little bit to Laura's point, just to make sure I, for my, for my money, protein is the only one I would ever care about. Like, let's just make yeah. sure you're getting enough. And right. it's good to benchmark that with like a chronometer or something like that, but literally just to get an, a sense of being able to eyeball it. And then we put that tool away and we go back to this like detective piece where it's like, how is this feeling in my body? You know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think what we're doing, and I, I love both of your approaches because I think, you know, the extreme counting approach is way over here. I'm not so sure right. you always have to go there. I just think that sometimes you can't be all quality. Sometimes it does become a little bit more quantity, right? So the completely subjective is over here and the completely objective is over here. And sometimes you need to become a little bit more objective. And that could just simply be, let's eyeball it. That could simply right. be, let's put it down. Let's pay attention. But I'm not so sure that any, everyone needs to go over here. And from a business perspective, I agree completely that you can absolutely stake your claim in one area and just basically be like, listen, I'm going to take all these people who have been crazy counters their whole life, who can't escape from it. And I'm going to teach them how to do more intuitive eating, or I'm going to take all these intuitive eaters who've never got results and stayed overweight and unhealthy because they never sort of learned. And I'm going to be sort of the macro person. I think that is fantastic. I, but I also think that we should in our brains go both approaches can work fantastically. And from my perspective, I think moving people to the middle is great. Now, if I had my bias, like if you forced me on a bias, I would say I would prefer most people not have to think about food, right? Like right. I would prefer exactly. them not have to count and weigh and measure everything. Mm -hmm. That is, we're now in a, in a time where when we're dealing with people who are obese and stuff like that, that is not always possible. But that would be great. And that would be my bias. So typically, like I, you know, I have uh, my company, Metabolic Living, when we are doing our coaching, we essentially, our goal is stated to get people to stress less and care less and have to pay less attention to food. So that mm -hmm. is a little bit more over here on the yeah. sort of intuitive side. But along the way, depending on the person, we have to kind of go, you know, to counting or at least paying, you know, sort of close attention. Now, here's the other thing, though, that brings up a really important point about humans in general. And I, I'm almost positive the two of you are going to agree with me on this. But here's what happens when we talk about 
this conversation. What people mostly do is they go, okay, so Jay, Aaron, Laura, you're essentially saying, hey, you got to do some trial and error with your metabolism, right? Well, mm -hmm. I hate that. Like, what if I can't figure it out? Like, where do I start? Now I'm confused again. You guys are telling me it's all trial and error. And to me, this is, a, again, a very, if, if you're unbiased, it's a very easy question to answer. And the question is basically what I call structured flexibility. I just look at you and say, let me tell you, if, if you weren't here, you know, talking to me, what would be your natural sort of, you know, thing that you gravitate towards? Would you want to go vegan or vegetarian? Are you more of a primal? Do you like the idea of keto? Is intermittent fasting appeal to you? Right? And they're like, yes, I, intermittent fasting. I've heard about that. And part of me wants to do that. I'm like, fine. That's going to be your structure to start structured yeah. flexibility. So yeah, mm -hmm. we can start with any structure you want. I can give you any protocol off the board. That's not a problem. The, the sin in my mind as a coach is to go, this is the way to do it. This is the only way to ever do it. And if you can't do this, you don't have any willpower. To me, I'm like, I'll start you wherever you want. I have many, many tools. I'll start you with a structure. And then from there, schmeck and check, heck and check, mm -hmm. results. And to me, what I would say is this, and this is the part that I think a lot of people and, you know, you know, I'm fine with you two challenging me on this. We can talk about it because it's just fun. But I'll, I'll give you a statement that might seem shocking to people, and then we'll see what you two think about this. To me, here's how I look at this. I don't care what you're eating. I don't care if you're eating candy canes and cotton candy all day long. So long as it keeps your heck and schmeck in check, it optimizes body composition, and when I go look at your vitals and your blood labs, they're all optimizing. From my perspective, if it achieves those three things, I don't care what you're eating. I don't care if you're eating 50 bananas every day. If your heck is in check, your body composition is optimizing or staying in healthy ranges. And when I look at your blood labs and vitals, you look healthy on paper, then I'm going to tell you, keep doing that. And I think most of us would agree candy canes and cotton candy aren't going to get you there. But right. still, to me, that's my barometer. So I just go, if you're getting results, yep. then I don't really care. And I'm interested what you two think about that statement, because it is kind of a shocking statement for some people. Well, I have this uh, phrase that has become inadvertently a catchphrase in my practice. I didn't know I was using it all the time, but my clients pointed it out to me. It's like, you can eat whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want. Just make those food choices from a place of information like a grown ass adult, <laughs> basically, is, is how it goes. It's like, go ahead, have vodka gummy bears. How does it feel? Like, mm -hmm. is your brain foggy for three days after eating pizza? Or is it fine? If it's fine, congratulations, you can eat pizza. I'm not so lucky. I have to make the decision. If I'm going to have pizza, I have to look at my calendar and make sure I don't have any speaking engagements the next three days because my brain <laughs> checks out, right? You, you do the detective work and then you make all your food decisions like a grown ass adult. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you 100% as far as, you know, as long as you are able to live the life you want to live, and all those health markers are there, whether you're, I, I don't really care what they're e eating anyway, but typically speaking, that's not my client, right? Mm -hmm. Typically speaking, the reason someone's coming to me is because something is not in check, yeah. right? And yeah. um, when we talk about this, sort of the intuitive side versus kind of the tracking side, I think everybody, the goal, my goal anyway, as a coach to, is to get everybody to the point where they've built the skills and the habits to the degree that it becomes effortless. But in the beginning, it's a learning curve and it has to be very on purpose. And this is, you know, I learned this concept back in my old career about just um, competency, right? That every people typically come in, those that don't even realize anything's wrong. Like they don't know what they don't know, right? They're completely unaware of how just incapable they are, right? Until something happens. Now they become very consciously incompetent at whatever it is that has them concerned. And they're very aware of it, but they don't know what to do about it. And that's when they start learning things, right? And they start reading articles and listening to podcasts and asking people that they trust. And then um, a flip, something switches, they either hire a coach or they put stuff into practice. And now they become very consciously competent. Like I, I know what I need to do now, but I still have to work really hard at it. Right. This is where the tracking and all the food journaling kind of comes in. And then you get to the point, like you said, 
it's so ingrained now. I'm, I'm unconsciously competent. I don't have to think about it anymore. I know what a serving size for me is. I know what a plate should look like. And I don't even, I, and I can be at Denny's and still build myself a meal that fits my needs, right? McDonald's, any place like that. Um, so I 100% agree with you. I mean, o- over time, I, I don't really care what you're eating as long as it's working for you, but you've got to build the skills and you've got to develop the habits so that it works. The one thing that, yeah. The one thing that's just a little bit of a gray area though for health coaches is that we really can't, um, we can't take into account the blood markers that's out of scope for us. So, you know, that's where we keep our clients, uh, doctors close, I guess, or encourage them to keep their doctors close. So we really have to rely more on, I think the, the mm-hmm. subject, well, this, there's still objective measures we can, we can look at like, okay, are your pants getting looser? Um, I don't know what else is there. Right. But we, we really can't look at those blood markers, but, um, I do think that the dance between subjective and objective is important. And what I've seen is, um, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's, it's like people feel like they have to be in, you're either in one camp or the other. It's this like evidence-based crew who are like, show me the evidence, show me the meta-analyses. It's like, oh, do, like, do I need to show you a study that tells you it really hurts when you smash your hand with a hammer? No, we know that it hurts when you <laughs> smash your hand. There's no research to support that. Like, it's, it's a little maddening that we're, we're doing this infighting. And yeah. um, but I think the balance between subjective and objective is really where a coach needs to like just or, or that, that dance between those two extremes of the spectrum is where we got to kind of, we got to play. Yeah. And let me say like. something on the evidence-based crowd. Cause I know many people, again, I look at this again there to me, uh, it, it's, it's the same thing again, in a sense, like to me, I just look at it like this. Uh, to me, science is absolutely important. I'm a, I'm a research nurse. So if you follow mm-hmm. me on even Instagram, you'll see I'm, I read every morning and oftentimes the things I'm reading, I will put up or the things I read that week I will put up. Now, here's an interesting thing about that though. What, if you understand research, you'll understand that this is about averages. No, you know, research studies are about averages. They're not about individuals. And so from that perspective, research is a great tool to refine the approach, but it should not define your approach. And it's funny because I'm, I'm an individual who studies this stuff. Uh, just understand what evidence-based medicine actually means and evidence-based practice actually means. Most people don't realize that research is only one part of that. There's three parts to evidence-based practice. Part one, and this is like, go look up the uh, definition of evidence-based medicine. There's three parts. One is understanding the research uh, sort of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? This is what happens to with my thyroid, sort of the, the state of the industry in research, right? So mm-hmm. what is the, what does the body of evidence tell us? That's one part of this. The next part is what is my clinical experience, my clinical intuition, my thousands of hours working with individuals tell me. And then sort of the next part is what is the individual sitting in front of me? What are they sort of telling me? This is what evidence-based practice actually is. It's integrating research, clinical experience, and the individual. So in a sense, the, the catchphrase I use to help you remember this is research should refine your approach, not define your approach. So here's what I mean by that. If I'm doing intermittent fasting, let's say, and I have, you know, uh, I'm experimenting with intermittent fasting and a study comes out and I'm getting some good results on it um, with some people and poor results with others. And typically, like I said, a third will get good results. Everyone else gets bad results. If you want, you know, anyone who's listening to this, who's not a health coach, if you want to be humbled every single day, come into our field because we fail right. most of the time, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. We're failing <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> it, it's a very humbling profession, but here's the interesting thing. Then a research study comes out and says, Oh, we can get the same results with fasting by having up to 500 calories per day. So you don't have to fast completely, or you can get, if you have up to 300 calories in your, you know, outside of your, your eating window, that seems to be just about the same as going without food. By the way, this is not a real study, but I'm just saying if, if that research came out and I saw that, then I can go, Oh, you know what, why don't then we add a little bit of extra here and there? Because the research says that. And then I get to use that information and then see if it works on this client, right? So that's the first thing I'll say about evidence-based practice. Now, the other thing I'll say about this, and this is what I think separates 
really good coaches from everyone else is to realize that as a good coach, you should not be teaching protocols. You should be teaching a process. And here's what mm -hmm. I mean by that. What I mean by that is that when someone comes to you and says, my friend did keto or my friend did intermittent fasting or my friend did vegetarian or vegan or my friend did primal or whatever. What you should be doing is teaching a process. You should not be focusing on the strengths and weaknesses of that protocol. You should be saying, perfect. If you want to try that, that's fine. But remember the process. We need to know that your metabolism stress barometer is responding appropriately. Let's try it and see, does Schmeck go out of check or does it stay in check? Also, let's see, does it deliver results? And if it does, then you can keep that aspect of things. And this also goes into questions about, hey, hey, Aaron, hey, Laura, can I have wine with dinner? From my perspective, instead of focusing on, well, wine is alcohol and it, it can <laughs> disrupt your liver and it does X, Y, Z, I'm simply going to go, forget the protocol, forget the facts. I'm simply just going to go, let me ask you this. When you have wine with dinner, are you likely to drink more wine, eat more at dinner and then want dessert? Or are you less likely to want those things? That's a process. And as soon as I, yeah. I, you, you kind of go through that process with them, they go, oh, yeah, when I have wine, I end up eating more and I want dessert mm -hmm. too. Like then wine's probably not going to be a good thing for you. Or, hey, you know, when I have wine, I realize I don't eat as much as the, of the starch um, and I don't want dessert and I don't end up drinking after that. It's just it, it's, it's what I prefer. Then I'm going to say, good. And so what we're doing is teaching a process. Now, here's what's the benefit of this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm 46. I'm going to be approaching andropause soon, right? So my hormones are going to be changing a little bit. Women go through this right from the get-go. They go through, you know, um, they start menstruating. They have kids. They uh, also go through uh, three stages of many menopause, perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause. The metabolism will change in all yeah. these stages. Now, if you've just focused on protocols, what happens is you're leaving your client confused when the metabolism changes. Instead, if you focus on a process of teaching them, here's how you kind of look at your metabolism and uh, work this process, you're actually giving them something that they could use forever. It's the, it's the metabolic equivalent of giving a person a fish versus teaching them to fish. Mm -hmm. What you want is when this metabolism changes, and it will, right? Yeah. You have a kid, your metabolism is going to change. You go through menopause, andropause, your metabolism is going to change. You go through a stressful period of time, your which we all three went through. Like, you know, my metabolism, I just, I, I went through the same kind of thing. It changed. And now I can't tolerate as many carbohydrates as I once did. I can't do fat, you know, as like I used to do. Right. So this is what we should be teaching people. And, and one final sort of understanding that I think is critical based on bias, right, is that I don't care, uh, you know, what you call it. You can have the, you know, organic, free-range, gluten-free, healthy, clean, uh, organic Shangri-La meal. If that meal does not uh, help you eat better later, then it's none of those things, right? right? The perfect meal is not the perfect meal. The perfect protocol is not the perfect protocol if it ends up causing you to eat more of the of worse things later and so what we have to understand is by teaching processes instead of protocols we can teach our clients this and it also helps us as as you know health coaches get better results because now instead of getting 25 percent you know results with our clients now we can get 40 percent results we're still going to fail most of the time because we can't control what people put in their mouths and do right but we get better results and so I'm just curious what your thought is there and how you guys work, work that. And if you agree or disagree or have anything to add to that. I absolutely love that actually. And I, I think if we can focus on that and have the client focus on that too, it also just helps create a better relationship with themselves and their body that they're, you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. This is just where you are today. And let's, Focus on what's going to serve you today. This is kind of where a lot of this mindset shift can come, right? And to stop sort of beating yourself up. I see it oftentimes when I work with couples. You know, they're both on the same protocol. They're both on the same diet and they're doing the same workouts, but they're getting different results, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, I'm sure you see that all the time and it's helping. Um, I try to help my women understand you're not a little man. 
<laughs> you're not, you are totally different. And because of that, you, you know, we're going to use the same process. This, I, I haven't used that word till now. So I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, but you're, because the, we're, we're using the same process, but we're going to arrive at a different protocol. Absolutely. I love it. I just actually wrote a post about wine uh, that was pretty much in favor of that because I love wine and people always ask me, I think people come to me because they think I'm going to be like, sure, drink wine, Wine's guzzle awesome. it up. <laughs> but so I was like, okay, people always ask me what I think about wine. Here's what I think. Does it make you eat more? Does it make, does it mess up your sleep? Does it do this? Does it do that? So you get to decide. In fact, I had a client who said to me one time, she said, Aaron, before I started working with you, I used to have a little bit of milk chocolate every day. And I, I really miss that. Like, can I have just a little bit of milk chocolate every day? I said, I don't know. Can you? Like, I love that answer. <laughs> yeah. Is like, if you can, you can. But if it, if it opens up, you know, if it wakes up that sugar dragon, then, you know, let's just play around with it. See what happens. Right. So. Yeah. I love um, that. I, I find myself that same thing. I, I yeah. literally answer questions like that all the time. I don't know. Can you? You tell me. Exactly. What to do. What, well, what to do to your heck schmeck. What to do to your body comp. Well, th this is coaching by definition. And I, th right. by definition, what we need to teach our clients is self-efficacy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I believe like, I think clients, when they come to us, they think, oh, I need a coach to hold me accountable. It's like, well, yes. not really. I mean, kind of, but more importantly, you need to develop that accountability from within. And I'm here to help you do that by educating you and supporting mm -hmm. you and, and playing detective with you. So to me, this is just, this is dictionary definition coaching. And anybody who's listening who thought health coaching was going to be handing out meal plans. Yeah, it's not, it's not how it is. That's not how it goes. Yeah. And Laura, you mentioned one thing about women, which I think we should just focus on just for yeah. a second, if you don't mind. It's, it's one of these things that I think what most, most of the time we're seeing women, right? Most women are the ones coming to us coaches to get right. help. And I do think when you understand the stress barometer, the other thing you need to understand is women are the gender of childbearing and child rearing. And as a result of that, they are and do have, in my mind, a more sensitive stress barometer. Now, yeah. some people will balk at this, but understand it wasn't until 2001 that some of these mandating bodies in the research started saying, hey, look, we've got a problem. Women are extremely underrepresented. That is 2001. Women yeah. are extremely underrepresented in the research. To me, this is absolutely atrocious and it's still going on. So in a sense, you made a statement that said, we're not little men. Uh, absolutely. And what's happening now is that even still, women and men are lumped in to essentially the same category. And again, this is why this protocol versus process is very important. If you start to understand that women are built differently than men. There are real biological differences between men and women. These hormones do impact men and women differently. Now, we can argue um, the, the subtleties of this. To me, does that mean women should eat and train differently than men? Not necessarily. Plenty of women can do just fine on male-dominating programs. But what it does also say is perhaps female-specific uh, you know, sort of interventions are necessary for some women. So it's not to mm -hmm. say women should always train different and eat different than men, no. It's just to say, understand women are different than men. Women are perhaps, depending on the woman, a little bit more stress sensitive and that they will potentially need different modalities to help. For example, training with the menstrual cycle may yeah. be, quote, may be something that women want to experiment with. Uh, we know that when women go through menopause, you can give a 40-year-old woman who's not in menopause a bolus of carbohydrate, glucose, and then you give a woman who's post-menopause that same bolus of carbohydrate, glucose, and you will see completely different responses just by nature of estrogen not being there, right? right. And so the, this is just an important thing, I think, for coaches to understand. Now, I'm not saying you need to do anything with it. I'm just saying that when your female clients are telling you this is not working for me in the same way it's working for the male clients, there's a very important reason for that. And understand that we don't have, because it hasn't been done, all the research that we need to have on female uh, metabolism. So yeah. it's just a very important thing. I think we'd be remiss uh, that if we didn't say it. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I agreed. 
You just reminded me of a book I needed to buy. I, you just reminded me of a book. I just bought it on Amazon while you were talking because <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, the book is called Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men and How Women Aren't Showing Up in the Research for Anything, uh, say, like healthcare, uh, finance, industry, safety, we're not being represented. And so all the data, all this objective, theoretical, you know, air quotes data is yeah. only kind of objective in, in, if you're talking kind of about men. So that's, that's where that blank end of objective and subjective is is again once again yeah. that's the takeaway that's the pull quote for this episode <laughs> it's yeah. like, right and not to get all political but to me it's it is very very important that we are not just looking at this but we should be angry about it especially if we care about health care in general this is not something that's okay it, it's right. just not and and we need to be loud about it in my opinion yeah. I agree. Yeah. We, uh, so this week um, we're programming for the gym and it's been a long time since we've done any kind of max, like figuring out where your, where your max is just so we can work on kind of where you should be during other, other strength components. And it's hard to do this in a group class format, as you can imagine. Yeah. But, um, you know, so I, I post a little something just based on my own experience about, you know, where I am in my menstrual cycle and the difference of different sort of training modalities. And, but the, the whole point of this is, you know, ladies, we got to just lean into this a little bit and, and, and help this work for us instead of fighting against it and, and feeling bad. You know, you don't, you, you're just not going to be a man. And that's awesome because you're a woman and let's figure out how to train appropriately, eat appro and just celebrate the fact that we're women and that our bodies can do amazing things. And we just need to treat it better instead of, you know, cause we have a lot of husband and wives that come into our gym and the husbands will lose weight really fast sometimes, you know, and women, not so much. And she's like, I'm, but I'm doing the same workout. I'm like, yeah, but you weigh like 40 pounds less and you don't have anywhere near the muscle he has. Yep. And so you have to literally work out more to get the same result. Is that really what you want to do? No. All right, then let's get over it. And let's just set a new path for you and celebrate what your body does. Because by the way, I bet if we do a long chipper where you're moving slower and it's longer, you're going to smoke him because he's going to go out of the gate like a maniac and drain all his glycogen out. Meanwhile, you're kind of burning fat and you're just chipping away at it and boom, you're done. And she's like, you know what? You're right. It is how it works. Yeah, it's interesting that in sport, when we look at sport, we, if we take uh, the research in sport, the longer the sport goes, ultra endurance, you know, women start to win. They, they mm -hmm. dominate men in uh, sort of endurance in that regard. And one clinical pearl I can give to all the coaches that, uh, that uh, is very important when dealing with women is that most of the time, you know, the woman probably, it, it, remember, it's a stress barometer. And so their stress system is a little bit more sensitive and especially at menopause when estrogen and progesterone go down think about these as stress armor mm -hmm. once they go away the stress barometer automatically ticks up and so this is one of the reasons why women who go through menopause if you simply start move away from a calorie counting approach more to a carb counting approach and move away from high intensity exercise to more stress reducing activity um, lots of walking and stuff like this, uh, you almost always end up with a better response in these women. It's just a clinical pearl to try. Mm -hmm. Now, is it perfect? Of course not. It's not perfect. We talked about the idea that, you know, everyone's different, but uh, I started getting tremendous results, especially in that population when I just st stopped thinking diet and exercise. To me, there's four aspects of metabolism. There's diet, there's exercise, there's mindset slash mindfulness, and then there's sort of movement. I call them mm -hmm. the four M's actually. So mindfulness, movement, and meals and metabolics. Most people are focusing on meals and metabolics, meals and metabolics, right? Diet and exercise, mm -hmm. diet and exercise. Especially with women, they will respond better, especially post-menopause, if you move them and balance out this equation and start doing more mindfulness and movement, mindfulness and movement. I'm not saying move away from meals and metabolics. I'm just saying when you're doing that, especially at the extreme, you're ticking up that stress barometer in a major way for females and you need to sort of balance this out. Same will happen for men. It just happens later. So just an extra sort of clinical pearl there for people who are working with mostly women, which I think is going to be most of us. A lot of people, yeah, yeah. pretty much. Well, I mean, it's so annoying because I have so many things I want to talk about, but we're also getting close on uh, our time here. <laughs> I know, same. Um, I can like sit here and talk to you girls like I know. forever. We, so. ha we just have to, yeah. we have to book a part two. Yeah, because, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But, but I think it's important to mention to people listening that the reason why Dr. Jade Tita is talking about female hormones is because he's a pro at it. So can you talk a little bit about what you, the, the course you offer for uh, female hormones? 
Yeah, you know, I offer a certification for uh, those individuals who work mainly with females, which is a lot, and who really are sort of confused why their women are not getting the same results as men. So this course essentially teaches you everything about the differences between female metabolism and male metabolism, and also how estrogen and progesterone impact uh, the uh, metabolism, you know, sort of directly and indirectly. Remember, we have uh, receptors for yeah. uh, these hormones all over our body, brain, muscle, fat, including ovaries, breast, you know, and those areas. So how does that work? How does it impact mood and sleep and hunger and mood and energy and exercise performance and exercise uh, recovery and all of those things? This course essentially teaches you that so you can, you know, basically work better with women. So thanks for asking about it. It's very sweet. No, no, no. I, I'm asking because I want to take it and I yeah. think you know, <laughs> know about it. <laughs> yeah. Where can people find it? it uh, jadetita.com. If you go to the store and then you can click on um, the university there, there's the, the courses there that people can take. Yeah. yeah. Now, I would encourage anybody listening. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Actually, that's a good point. We should talk about the new business venture. Yeah. But I just want to encourage anybody listening, because we're not going to probably get to this, that to follow Jade Tita on Instagram and other places where you're followable, because some of the things I wanted, I had wanted us to get into, which we're not going to have time to, is some of the analogies and, and amazing ways of, of delivering content that you do that makes these metabolic concepts just so gettable for people. Like your four metabolic toggles, I love those. Mm -hmm. uh, you have this amazing traffic analogy that you use for like fuel partitioning and it just lots of really cool ways to get this more advanced sort of metabolism science information and be able to then translate it to your clients. So just, just want to thank you for doing that. Um, so masterfully and anybody listening has to go check this out because you'll learn a lot. So let's hit up Laura's question. Cause you had a question, Laura, about uh, this new. Yeah. Cause business. you were, you were telling us before we started recording that you basically either sold your business or partnered with another business to create this metabolic lifestyle business and that you are actually incorporating health coaching into this business. And so I really want coaches or aspiring coaches to hear what you're doing and how you're using coaches and why to just help inspire them for the benefit that they do. And then, oh, by the way, you might be looking for more coaches at some point. Would you yep. speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, you know, the, the company is Metabolic Living, and you'll start seeing more of the branding come out at the end of uh, 2020. And mm -hmm. essentially what we've built in this is that uh, the health coaching world is sort of blowing up, and for good reason, because most healthcare providers, you know, in, you know, including in the alternative medicine community, are not trained in behavior change, right? right. They don't really sort of get this. So we coaches... And it's really interesting, right? Because I, I have been a strength and conditioning specialist. I'm a physician licensed in Washington State and in California. Well, guess what? When people ask me what I do, guess what I tell them I do most of the time? I'm a health coach. And the reason mm -hmm. why is because I think it's actually the most powerful thing I do. That might be uh, confusing for some of you health coaches listening to this, but I do. I actually think I make more of a difference as a health coach and an educator. And so the company basically came on and said, how can we make the biggest difference? let's bring sort of health coaches on. And the type of coaches that we're wanting are people who are schooled in metabolism, like the people you all train. So essentially what we're looking for is we're looking for coaches who have been trained in, uh, you know, sort of health coaching and metabolism, similar to what you both do in your education. Then we mm -hmm. take them and bring them into our system, give them a little bit of extra work that we do, and we put them to work. Um, in 12 week programs that basically go through a year. And essentially the best way to think about it is everything we talked about in this uh, sort of episode, that's what we teach them. We teach them in a year time how to go from a dieter to a metabolic detective. We teach them to move away from protocols into process so that they can basically uh, create their own diet built for them by them. That's essentially mm -hmm. the goal. I love it. Amazing. It's I so know. exciting. It's very exciting. It's very exciting because I remember when I saw that job posting come out um, because Laura and I both are on the faculty of a school that teaches health coaches and um, sometimes, the, sometimes they can get a little bummed that the opportunities aren't there. And it's like, you know what? They're coming. Like it's coming. It's your point. This, this is an exploding field. And I love that functional medicine and alternative medicine are, are not only like 
considering health coaches, but are like, no, we, we need them. Like they're what we need. We had this conversation with Dr. William Davis who wrote Wheat Belly. He was on our show, one of our early episodes. And he said, health coaches know more about health than most doctors do. We need them. Well, doctors need them. Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, yeah. And to health coaches listening, the opportunities are coming. They're there. Um, just, you know, start showing up your education and getting, get, get your resume ready, polish it up because. Yeah. Stand proudly and with confidence in what you do, because um, anybody listening here, you just heard Dr. J say it's the most powerful thing he does, even though he's a clinical practitioner and he's licensed and he's a, he's a doctor, right? But the most powerful thing he does is coach others through behavior change, which is, that's our, that's our space, man. Yeah. Own it. yeah, we need to, we need to own it. And thank you. Thank you both for the work that you do in that field, because it's, it is needed. We all have got to be pushing forward. There's so many people out there uh, that need us. And I will say one more thing here to people who are um, a little bit sort of apprehensive about sharing, you know, what they're doing out there in the world. Cause before we started this, uh, we start, we were talking about social media. We mm-hmm. live in a world now where a lot of us health coaches are a little bit, you know, maybe apprehensive about putting our stuff out there. Just remember this, in my way of thinking, you are uniquely tuned. Your voice is uniquely tuned to certain individuals who can only hear you. They might mm-hmm. hear me speak or Aaron speak or Laura speak, but we don't touch them the way you could, which speaks to the fact that we need your voice out here. So that's where I'll Ooh, sort of leave it. I love that. That's, That's like nice the best note to end, to end on. <laughs> awesome. So we will have to have you out again, particularly maybe towards the end of the year as metabolic living is really kind of up and running. And yeah. we just, you know, yeah, there's so much more to talk about. So, but it'd thank be you. Cool it's to, been a pleasure. It'd be cool to keep finger on the pulse of how that goes. I'm really excited yeah. that it's, it's even a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I will love to come back and we'll, we'll talk about it soon. Awesome. Love it. Thank you. Thank you both. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.